All right. Good morning, everybody. I'm really excited to be uh, kicking us off here. So um, I'm Maya Haptis. I'm a senior consultant with Fourth Economy Consulting. We're headquartered in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, and we I'm going to be talking uh, today about a program called Allegheny Together that we actually run uh, for Allegheny County Economic Development. And um, we service uh, a variety of business districts in municipalities outside the city of Pittsburgh, but within Allegheny County, uh, which are LMI eligible because the program is funded through CDBG dollars. So we have a, a partner, a subcontractor on the project, Evolve Environment Architecture. They do all our physical planning for the strategic plans that I'm going to be talking about. And just to show you our um, kind of core project team, we have uh, a couple of folks that I work with who are community coordinators. We work with the county. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we work with Evolve. And so, as we all know, um, you know, Main Street developed around critical masses of workers where industry was developing. And so we have these hyper-localized commercial centers. Um, we have about 129 municipalities within Allegheny County alone. Not all of them have those commercial centers, but a large portion of them do. And then in Allegheny County, you know, what we saw is um, over 140,000 40, manufacturing jobs from 1978 to 1998 being lost and that creating significant changes to the economy. And so, um, you know, municipalities that are eligible for our program are among the hardest hits by those regional economic trends and those shifts particularly within their main street core, because there's no longer sort of the residents there that they service. There's, you know, not a lot of um, opportunity for businesses. And so that creates a challenge, which I'm sure a lot of you in the room are familiar with, um, with commercial vacancy in the commercial corridor, blight, um, and a lot of other critical issues. And so um, through the Allegheny Together program, what we do is uh, articulate a business district vision with the community and create a strategic action plan and then we support uh, implementation of that ac action plan with uh, specific technical assistance. Define so after they've defined the direction that they want to go in, uh, we support them through uh, implementing those strategies. And we I'll talk a little bit as well about how we set those priorities today, as well as um, how we build organizational capacity. So we look at the core uh, areas of marketplace and identity. So if you're familiar with the Main Street Four Point approach. It's very, very similar, um, but that's the that's the approach that we take with them. Um, we look at current and future market trends. So um, that's how we set our economic development strategy. We look at district identity. So we start to look at what uh, events have happened in the area that we're working in, what um, what things have gone away, what are the uh, you know, where is the historic and cultural amenities that we could start to kind of recapture and talk about um, when we set a new and uh, distinct identity? And then look at the character of place. You know, what is it like to be a pedestrian experiencing the district? Where are the, uh, where is the network of court, you know, kind of networks in the corridor? Are there uh, river connections that can be captured? Where's the transportation? Um, in Allegheny County, we have a lot of trail development. So we often see, um, you know, recreational trails uh, and think about how to connect those to Main Street. So those are just some of the things that we consider. Um, and then to talk a little bit about how we build organizational capacity, um, we create a business district advisory council. So again, similar to like a Main Streets committee, these are some of the types of representatives that we work with the leadership team and borough staff to engage. Um, and those folks meet throughout our strategic planning process. And the idea is to get them engaged so that they continue um, to help implement the plan going forward after the first year. And so to show just a little bit of sort of how that works, uh, we work with the county and the consultant team with the leadership and the borough staff. And then we really empower them to be the ones who communicate out with the business district advisory council and then communicate out to the general public. So when we undergo our community engagement, um, we do a community tour, we do stakeholder interviews and uh, we do a community wide survey. And then we basically cap all that off with what we call build sessions, which are community engagement sessions, but with a real focus around um, the strategies that we see emerging in those place, uh, those uh, areas of marketplace and identity. And so uh, these are some of the questions that we might look at, um, you know, where are the areas that it's easiest to transition commercial properties back into productive use? Um, you know, where are 
locations that can contribute most to the physical fabric, and then what public realm investment might need to be made. Um, what are those sort of quick quick fixes in the short term that we that we make improvements to the physical public realm, and then what are the long term strategies? Um, and then we also are looking at market as well, and um, you know, talking to local residents, looking at where, uh, you know, where are people working in the district? Are they leaving the district to work, uh, which is often the case, and um, looking at some of those trends and identifying, you know, adjacent employment centers, looking at transit and some of those other things as well. Um, and so just to share a little bit before we move into our case study, um, our communities have access to resources and tools. What we do is actually uh, have a website that we share with them. We have uh, ongoing funding resources as well as uh, you know kind of time sensitive ones that we send out in a newsletter, and so um, you know we've had 33 communities go through the program. Our firm has been managing it since 2019, but it's in uh, been in inception since 2007, and so um, all those communities can learn from each other. And then also there's just this um, you know kind of online resource that they have access to, and we also have an annual summit. So uh, the place that I wanted to talk to you a little bit more in detail about today is Mount Oliver Borough, which is actually within the uh, city limits of Pittsburgh, but it's a separate borough and it's got a population of about 3,300. So um, it's, you can see a little, um, you know, kind of piece of the main street there, some of the historic facades. And um, I wanted to share some of the, um, some of the items that we first identified when we were working there, and then some of the strategic action um, items that were identified and how they implemented those. Um, so looking at some of the land use takeaways, we were looking at the Brownsville corridor. Um, there's many older buildings need running, needing renovation. Um, we identified you know, a lot of commercial vacancy, but that residents, it's a very dense area. Residents are very close to the main street. So talking to them about the opportunities there, what kinds of businesses would they like to see? Um, and starting to look again in those areas of marketplace and identity, um, identifying for market, we, you know, seen that the district is, is stabilized, but there is a slight population decline, um, looking at the median household income and knowing that retail vacancy was, uh, at least over at 50%. And this was, uh, those numbers are actually pre COVID. Um, that was our initial baseline analysis that we did. Um, and then looking at place, identifying um, some of the things they had already been doing and leveraging, right? So it wasn't like we walked in and there was no, no existing infrastructure, no existing efforts to uh, make change within the main street, but uh, we wanted to really build and capitalize on those things that were already happening. So I'm gonna move um, on to just showing, you know, there, there is some great architecture there, right? Um, we had this clock tower plaza, which you see in the bottom, which we actually ended up doing like a full design plan for um, how it could be used as a community uh, space for community events, working with them because that was a priority for the community, but they already had a lot of things going on. Um, and so what we did is set with them their strategic action plan. So um, <clears throat> marketing the area as a destination for small businesses, activating the business um, district with new business growth, and then they really wanted to create this active plaza in the heart of the business district um, where they had uh, they have a lot of community events. They wanted to keep holding them within the business district, but also have larger events at the Clock Tower Plaza. Um, and so we really moved into this piece of um, a strategic action plan. And so the reason I like to share Mount Oliver is I always say they're sort of like, you know, my A plus student, like they took their strategic action plan and they made it a checklist and they had little boxes and they said, okay, we're going to, we're going to form our arts committee. Okay. Check. And they did that. And then they actually made updated, um, they updated their zoning to be able to further support, um, you know, murals, arts events in the community, um, and, uh, su better support, uh, commercial businesses as well. So, um, the next thing that they started to do is actually to work with um, the uh, Hilltop Economic Development Corporation. So they did have the opportunity to, you know, have a really uh, robust economic development corporation that they could connect with. And um, working with them, they were actually able to apply to the Department of Community and Economic Development uh, at uh, 
for the state of Pennsylvania and uh, enter into the neighborhood partnership program. And they use the strategic action plan that we had developed with them to apply to that program and to enter into a, a six year agreement um, to be able to fund some specific programs that would uh, you know, really get at that, that change of business attraction, bringing new businesses into the corridor. Um, and so I'm gonna run through three of the programs um, that are, you know, it's pretty exciting to see. One was a rent abatement program. So um, they were actually to award within the first um, two years of that, uh, 12 awards in Mount Oliver Borough, and that subsidizes monthly rent for businesses. So this is really just coming out of COVID. And, um, you know, there was an opportunity of a lot of people starting new businesses, but again, some hesitancy around um, entering into multi-year commercial leases. And um, that also, they also wanted to be able to provide programming that would help the existing businesses. And so they put together what they call the MTAP, which is the Marketing Technical Assistance Program. And so um, they subsidized for SIP Studios, which is actually a local um, marketing firm within Mount Oliver to be able to work with the other businesses. So, you know, not bringing in a, a you know, Google technical support person, but actually like working with a local provider, which um, is pretty cool. And then what they were finally able to do is uh, implement a facade improvement program. So we see this, um, a lot of our communities are in need of this, but it's very difficult to find facade improvement dollars. And so what they were able to do is um, leverage those NPP funds, raise some additional funds and um, put into place a facade improvement program. And so since July, 2022, um, they had completed eight facades and then, um, had awarded seven more. And so um, it's, you know, this was something that I was really excited to see, because again, it's, it's hard for communities to find these funds to leverage. They knew this was a priority. Um, also being able to work within their rent abatement program and talking to property owners and making those connections and saying, you know, we had this facade improvement program and then we have a rent abatement program. And so if you wanna fix up your building, and then, you know, we can help you find a tenant. We can also, you know, help them through this rent abatement program. And so really, um, you know, being able to braid together those um, areas of assistance. And then, of course, once the business is up and running, maybe they're entering the marketing um, technical assistance program um, and, and really be able to give a lot of support to the new businesses that were moving in. And so all of those programs resulted in them, you um, uh, increasing their occupancy rate. So we went from that, you know, 50% commercial vacancy to about 70% occupancy in the district by the time that we were done with the program. So um, really exciting to see. It's a really interesting program to run. We actually only have a couple communities left in the county that are remaining to be eligible. So um, we're looking at how we can really uh, keep implementing the program and supporting the communities because, you um, it you know over 30 have run through it and um there are just a few more now so this year where we introduced two new communities um and there there are a couple more but we really want them to have you know they have to be lmi eligible to qualify for the cdbg funds then they have to have a main street right so not everyone has a main street that's like got some of those existing bones and then we do kind of check in with them on what are those elements of organizational capacity you know are there people there that are interested in being involved in the process because we can't just kind of go in and work there without that initial like excitement uh, from leadership and from the community. And so we do an application to kind of assess that element as well. So that's about all I have for you. Um, but this is just showing the before and after of uh, one of the facade programs. It's not the most beautiful building, but you can see that they, you know, they opened up those second floor windows um, bringing in, you know, potentially a residential tenant and then, um, you know, overall just getting things cleaned up and, um, you know, I, I think there's going to be a lot more to come. So thank you very much. What pays for you to be engaged in doing this? Like what's behind it that gets you into the community? Sure. Um, I just want to make sure I understand your question. Like, me personally, no, or, or in this, this program? Yeah, so the county was looking for a technical assistance provider to implement the program. And so they um, they actually put out an RFP that oh, our okay. firm applied for, okay. and we were awarded the contract in 2019. So, um, and we actually, you know, 
put together this specific slate of strategic, you know, strategic planning, looking at them over, you know, multi-year. And then our firm really works hard to bring together the data piece and the kind of, um, you know, qualitative side of what does the community want. And so in my previous Main Street work, for example, you know, the market isn't always going to show you that you can support a certain kind of business, but if you can do some community surveys and show that there's a real like desire um, on the part of the community, we saw, you know, uh, businesses effectively put that into their business planning documents to go after, you know, resources, loans, and other things. And so that was really effective. And so I sort of see it as like a similar strategy. Okay, cool. Yes. Yeah. Good deal. Yeah, we'll, we'll keep it moving. Hopefully I have time for more questions at the end if there are some. Uh, next up are John and Michelle Connor, and they're doing some work in Franklin, West Virginia. Yes, sir. Which is in the Potomac Highlands. Where's is that other descriptor? So, <laughs> all right. So, uh, all right, very good. Well, uh, good morning, everybody. My name is John Connor. Michelle, wave to everybody. Uh, my better half. Uh, but I drew the short straw, so you're going to hear from me this morning. So uh, the theater building um, that I'll be talking to you about in our project, it's really a complex piece of property. It consists of three commercial spaces, seven residential apartments. Um, originally, there had been a house on the site in the Franklin Fire of 1924. Uh, it, was, it was lost. Uh, a new brick structure was built in the 1920s, um, and it was a theater. And uh, the theater has uh, long since um, ceased operation. And in the 1980s, um, or actually 70s, the, the, the theater space was kind of divided. The sloping theater floor was, was built up flat. So it, it had already undergone um, a functional transformation uh, before we purchased it. And, and I learned early on in our endeavor that we need to like I usually lead with, and it's not going to be a theater again, because I think everybody in our community thinks, oh, neat, we could have a, a reopen a little town theater. Um, unfortunately, that, that ship has sailed. Uh, but as you'll see here shortly, we do have, uh, we have a few remnants uh, of the old theater. Um, but under that new configuration, with those three commercial spaces and a total of seven residential apartments uh, and, and two garage bays, uh, various tenants had come and gone uh, since the theater had closed and, and the renovations took place, as well as some changes in um, the ownership. Uh, and in October of 1996, Almost Heaven Habitat for Humanity purchased the theater building complex. And through the rental income of those spaces, uh, they were actually able to, to they cash flowed the property and essentially had free space. So for any nonprofits in the room who struggle with operating costs or operating expenses and you're renting a space, um, Habitat had kind of cracked that nut and had figured out how they were able to, uh, to have themselves a, a, a very established Main Street presence. Uh, we know all this because in 1998, Michelle began working for Almost Heaven Habitat for Humanity as the Director of Marketing and Development. And in 2000, she became the CEO when the founding executive director retired. Um, I came down, I served at the affiliate as an AmeriCorps VISTA in 2000 to 2001. Uh, and following my service, uh, I married the boss. So I spent the next 12 years working for the board, uh, doing, let me see if I can pause this. Here we go, bear with me. All right. Good. Uh, so, um, and, I, I focused on fundraising, grant writing, community relations, government relations as well. Um, and Michelle ended up, ah, I'm not liking this. The best laid plans of mice and men, they say, right? Okay, so um, take it back a notch. Um, I left working. Uh, so, so Michelle was very successful in her role. She grew the affiliate, uh, expanded it, and ultimately we took okay it's probably just keep rolling but we took um uh, i took my leave from habitat in, in uh, 2013 to go into public school teaching as a special educator and i founded full quiver consulting and michelle later left uh habitat after her 20-year tenure uh having grown the affiliate 
uh, to uh, being the most productive habitat affiliate. Um, after the floods of 2016, um, Habitat put their focus on Greenbrier County and uh, the offices uh, were closed in Franklin. Uh, so the, the building that we, uh, that, that Habitat occupied, the, the theater building on Main Street, uh, basically sat vacant. And for the next several years, uh, Michelle and I watched uh, as the building fell into a state of disrepair, uh, deferred maintenance, as tenants would move out, the apartments weren't advertised, um, and work yet maintenance issues were, uh, weren't, weren't addressed. So we knew firsthand the potential of the property that it had, uh, and it broke our hearts to see what was happening. So uh, we first inquired about purchasing the property in uh, 2018, or I'm sorry, in uh, early 2021, uh, but we were advised that it was under contract, and that deal fell through in May of 2021. The appraisal had come in too low uh, for the uh, prospective buyer to secure it. And in early spring of 2022, we put in an offer on the theater building um, of 140,000, which was the asking price. Um, I keep toggling and, and trying to hold this slide because this is kind of the birth of, birth of it all. So bear with me. Um, so in uh, Habitat really just wanted to kind of get out of the, the mortgage that they had. So they, they really did not profit much on that sale price. Um, but it was something we felt comfortable with and we knew the potential of the building. So on June 15th of 2022, we celebrated the seventh birthday of our youngest child, Thomas, uh, from the comforts of a beach cabana near historic Fort, Mon Fort Monroe in Virginia. And we'll forever remember that day. Uh, we had had a very encouraging video conference call with Ray, uh, Ray Muller, and some other folks he introduced us to. And before the sun set that day, we had filed articles of organization with the West Virginia Secretary of State's office and the theater building LLC was created. Uh, by the end of June, 2022, we had a signed sales agreement uh, with permission from Habitat to embark upon a cleanup. Um, we could clean up the property. Uh, we could uh, make some minor repairs at our own expense, of course, um, but we felt this was necessary in order to bolster the uh, uh, the soon to be ordered appraisal. So we had had the foresight and the knowledge that the previous appraisal um, had come in too low. And uh, so we spent about, I'd say about three thousand dollars, maybe, and um, and several weeks of our time uh, and our children's time, much to their chagrin, uh, working to spruce up the space. Um, as some of these next few pictures are going to illustrate. So in July of last year, we formally applied for DARE assistance. Um, I'll say it once, and then I'm going to call it DARE hereafter, the Downtown Appalachia Revitalizing Recreational Economies program, aptly named DARE, uh, and, and with Ray Moeller and his team. And we were specifically seeking as-is architectural drawings, uh, some code assessment of, of issues in the building, highest and best use assessment, and also um, initial cost estimating. We formally applied for the acquisition loan with our local community bank, Pendleton Community Bank, PCB. By August, we had been accepted, uh, or we had accepted an architectural proposal uh, for services and with the support of the DARE program, we benefited from work completed by Adam Rohalley uh, and his team at Omni Architects uh, out of Fairmont. Um, by August, or uh, in September, we drafted uh, the construction and rehab plan. And uh, and basically that was the final piece, having that, that, um, that plan in place was the final piece we needed to apply for the rehab loan, which we did through Pendleton Community Bank as well. Uh, they've been a fantastic uh, banking partner to us. Um, because of a, co uh, the, a condition of the acquisition loan from Pendleton Community Bank was that we would have to demonstrate the ability uh, to cash flow uh, because banks like to know that they're going to get paid back, last I checked. So uh, we, we went out and spoke to the community, leveraged uh, our relationships in the community, and try to get a sense of the unmet needs, unmet rental needs of the community, 
And it all resulted in us in getting intense to lease. So even before we owned the property with our vision and with the ability really to, to kind of uh, sell the vision, we, uh, we were able to get some intents to lease and uh, that was sufficient evidence to, to give some uh, comfort to the Pendling Community Bank. So um, we also kind of uh, addressed the uh, appraisal um, and there were some things that were missed on it. So again, we were able to do it. So our contractor, Blue Mountain Construction, um, we negotiated a deal with him uh, that he would uh, serve me. This timing is off. There we go. Uh, let me get JT back up here. So, uh, uh, so the architectural drawings I meant to say were were very key to helping us share our vision and tell the story. We heard about that this morning. Telling our preliminary story with our lender. Um, so this apartment here, uh, in this picture, um, we allowed uh, kind of incentivized because it's hard in our community to get contractors. Uh, to stick with you. <laughs> and uh, so we incentivized him by allowing him to kind of move in this apartment in its as-is condition, which he was more than happy to. Uh, he pays the electric bill. Um, this is uh, this was just one of the uh, apartments that actually is not going to remain residential. Uh, again, through the work of Omni Architects that we had, again, with their support, um, that particular apartment, we was recommended that we... Uh, convert its use from residential to something else. Um, we closed on the acquisition of the building on November 4th of 2022. Uh, for that sales price, we paid 20% down at closing and had an 80% uh, loan value. Um, we also decided using an online platform to assist us with the legalities and compliance of being landlords. Uh, and, and we subscribed to Turbo Tenant Immediately upon closing, uh, we signed the lease with our first commercial tenant, uh, and they moved in. Uh, Franklin Puff Palace, a vape shop and CBD gummy distributor, opened in the smallest commercial space, and uh, it was also required the least amount of rehab, so that was good. Uh, some overhead lights were replaced, and emergency exit signs were upgraded. Some new paint was applied. At the same time, we agreed to rent two of the apartments as is, one to an elderly woman uh, who needed housing going into the winter and um, to a school teacher who had just sold his house and needed a place to stay for the balance of the school year. Um, we did some introductory letters to the, the existing tenants uh, that we did inherit uh, one commercial tenant who really wasn't around much anymore and a residential tenant. So we kind of introduced ourselves and our vision to them um, as the new owners. Uh, we immediately started renovating the first two apartments that overlook Main Street, uh, 70A and 70B North Main. Uh, each experienced complete renovations and upgrades, including removal of drop ceilings, painting throughout, upcycled cabinets with new hardware, new switches, outlets, light fixtures, all new stainless steel appliances, and a new baseboard heater, uh, heaters throughout, and thermostats. One of the apartment has a green front door. Uh, and, and green cabinets, and the other has a blue door uh, and cabinets, so I like to refer to them as the Marshall and the WVU, um, or the green or the blue. So you go up the staircase, and uh, to, the, to the left is a green, and to the right is the blue. Um, there, Mrs. Connor is getting in on the action on that. So in December of 2022, right, so one, one month after we closed on the property with the acquisition loan, we closed on the rehabilitation uh, loan. It was a $100,000 loan we were approved for. Uh, we had a $30,000 match of our own money uh, committed. And uh, it was about that time that Pendling Community Bank asked us to display their financing sign in our window front, which we happily obliged. And we took the opportunity to launch a business Facebook page uh, for Theater Building LLC. And um, please like and follow our page if you guys are on Facebook. Um, in January of 2023, our first two fully renovated market rate apartments came online. We had marketed them simply through that Facebook page and a Chamber of Commerce email blast out to the community. Fair market rent in our county is, um, back one. be sure to pause there, I want to highlight these WVU kids. Um, 
So uh, this was our, our first tenant. Uh, we kind of lived it up and celebrated it with her. Um, and uh, so fair market rent for a one bedroom in our county is 900, I'm sorry, $595. And we listed the larger of the two apartments at $800 and $700 for the smaller of those two. And uh, our banker was a little surprised. We were gonna be asking that kind of price, but um, we had over 25 interested tenants uh, who, who knew upfront what the rental uh, costs were. Uh, so we quickly rented both of these units. Um, and our bank at, banker was also pleasantly astonished by how much and how quickly we had transformed the two spaces. So at the end of March of this spring, we traveled to WVU's campus and we met with uh, this batch of kids. They're young adults, but I call them kids because they're younger than me. Um, so these folks were, okay, these folks were the um, interior design students who kind of adopted the theater project. Uh, the theater building project and to give us some design ideas some some concepts for the layout uh, and we've enjoyed uh, their contributions so um, we also by april had renovated two additional apartments that are above the garage uh, these garage spaces and we listed each of those for 650 dollars each um, and they have subsequently been rented um, so in may uh, we attended a D.A.R.E. group session that was held in Petersburg, West Virginia. It was great to meet like-minded uh, folks, forward-thinking folks, and uh, throughout the region. And you, you should never underestimate the power and the benefit of networking with good people like you see on the screen here. Uh, it was also in May that our second commercial tenant opened her business. Um, uh, due to the timing of it, of her lease and our renovation schedule, we were actually able to kind of make some of the renovations uh, to meet her needs uh, and desires. Blown Away Hair Studio celebrated their ribbon cutting on May 23rd, following a soft opening that had occurred earlier in the month. Uh, there's Haley Haynes and the ribbon cutting as well. So in July, one of the As Is apartments became vacated. We completed a light rehab on that. Uh, only involved us picking up a big old roll of carpet and bringing that back. And uh, last month in August, we began our facade improvement. Uh, we restored the original fourth window that had been stuccoed and taken out and stuccoed over decades before. Uh, we painted the corbels, the stucco, the wall, we painted green. Uh, we, we replaced the overhanging roof. We installed a dentil molding face panel. Uh, we put metal roofing on the overhang. We also installed recessed LED lights under that overhang roof to improve nighttime lighting. The number of community folks, I'll tell you, who have stopped. Um, I mean, we've been at this for a while now, but but high profile Main Street activity in a small town, you get a lot of attention and it has all been positive. Uh, folks have come back. They tell us what they remember the, of going to the theater. They, they love that we're uh, putting some TLC into the building. So we've enjoyed that. Um, and uh, and good things are happening in Franklin. So you should come and see us. Earlier this month, we rented our newly, lightly renovated apartment for $550. Uh, it further enhanced the pro forma of the property. Uh, we are continuing to entertain plans uh, to operate that remaining third space, maybe as a co-working space, or uh, at a minimum, we're, we're advertising you know, flexible uh, office rent space. And we look forward to our one year anniversary of the ownership of the theater building. We anticipate our final phase of renovation to involve the repurposing of the last um, apartment, which we're gonna to convert to commercial use. We're gonna to try to incorporate that into a courtyard that's out back. And we still have high hopes and aspirations that we could develop some kind of uh, entertainment and or food and or drink venue within those garage bays. Um, and we're, and you know, we're looking forward to, to working with that. So. We're certainly open to answering any questions you may have um, whenever Ray feels appropriate yeah, at the end. And uh, uh, I'm also obliged to say, don't forget to offer us feedback through the Sketch app. You're right. and speakers were told to do that. So. Thank you, John. You're welcome. Thank you. Remarkable transformation that these uh, these guys undertook. And so really glad to have them be able to present on that and try to get to Franklin. 
There's other good things around Franklin too. There's a not nice maple distillery. Uh, <laughs> anyway, just saying. <laughs> Heather, Alex, good things in Grafton. Well, good morning. Um, my name is Heather Hudson, and I'm the executive director of Unleashed Tiger. And with me is, well, how do I get out of this? Uh, 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 hit forward, hit forward. forward. Okay, you went through all yours. Uh oh. Yeah, go for yeah, it. Somehow we got mine. And... Yeah, there, there we go. go. Okay. We'll go back. All right, there we go. All right. Um, and with me is Alex Renman. He's my board president. Um, so, Unleash Tiger, we are a nonprofit 501c3 organization based in Grafton, West Virginia. Um, we are a little bit different than a lot of nonprofits in that our mission is to identify and address the high level deficits of our community. So, a good way to look at that, really easy way to look at that, is with food pantries. Um, Unleashed Tiger will never be an organization to open a food pantry and meet immediate needs. We're more the organization to look at the underlying causes of those immediate needs and who can come together at a table to strategize to fix those needs. Um, and we are really built off of a modified version of the Worldwide Happiness Index, um, which Mr. Renneman took and regionalized to make it into the Almost Heaven Index. And in front of you are the programmatic pillars that really guide and drive everything that we do as an organization. Um, Alex, do you want to speak a little bit to this? Yeah, I think so. So, so I, it, this this is again to Heather's point. It's based on the world of happiness and actually the gross national happiness and the idea of how do we judge success in our community. And there's lots of ways people judge it. But as a, as a native growing up in that town, I see a lot of the things happening and people be excited about. But they aren't making a difference ultimately in the life of the average. Draft onion, if you will. And so really kind of like, how can we measure that so that we know whatever we're doing, we're not just putting effort into something that's not bringing real results. So while it's maybe not traditionally how projects get done in, in communities, if looking at an outcome base first is where we started, it's just helped us help to score our projects. So we know when we're getting ready to do something or something comes across the table, because once you start doing something, you all know the community. Thanks to start because oh you do this, you do this, you do this. <laughs> and so it gives us a chance to score. How well does this score across the board? And it also gives us a chance to look at our community and say, where are we, where do we have deficits to this point? Where are those high needs? And when you start looking at it through this lens, things kind of really become clear. It's a little bit of a code, code a decoder of, of where we should spend our time and resources. Not 100 percent not always right, but it does help help make sure that we're focusing where the outcomes are going. Yeah. So really, the programmatic pillars are the way that we look at the world around us, at the community around us, and identify the challenges that exist. So in Grafton, in front of you is a list of some of the high-level needs that exist in our community. And I'm sure that you're going to look at these and say, yep, 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 and yep, for the communities <laughs> that you guys live and work in as well, right? So we have everything from slum and blight, to structures that absolutely need to be torn down, to absentee ownership of really high potential properties. So these are the ones that don't need to be torn down, but nobody knows what to do with them. All the way down to a lack of strategic planning in a community. That's the first thing anybody asks you for whenever you start talking to big high level funders. What's your community plan and do your projects fit within it? We don't have that. Um, all the way down to central gathering spaces where the people can come together in our community and say, hey, these are the challenges. This is what we're looking at. We don't have that central hub inside of our community. So the way that Unleashed Tiger operates is we look at all of these challenges and we see possibility. And inside of that possibility is we look at what we have, what can we do with it? What are the needs and how can we marry them? So that brings us to kind of our cornerstone project, which is the Cohen Building. Um, this building was built in 1922, commissioned in 1925, 33,000 square feet. And this one was easier because it was already in our sphere of existence. We already owned it. Um, so it had been vacant for about eight-ish years when we started this project. Um, and we looked at it as a potential mixed use real estate that could do anything from retail co-working space all the way to eatery, private office space, housing. 
Um, so we've been working on this project since, um, well, really 2017, um, but it is now a new market and historic tax credit twin project. And we started down that avenue in 2019. And I always like to show this slide because when you tell somebody I've been working on a project <laughs> for five years, they're like, what do you mean? Well, these are just some of the things that we've had to do year over year. Um, and luckily, we've been able to find really good partners to come to the table to help us through it. Um, and this is just a slide showing some wow. of the partners that have been involved specifically in the Cohen project. Um, some of these are funders. Some of these are folks like Downstream and um, Brownfields that have just guided us all the way to Woodlands Development Group, who has really come beside of us as a co-developer and um, consult more than consultant on our team. That's a great slide. So through those partnerships, we've kind of had this development journey that's come along. So we started as wide-eyed people with really good ideas and an opportunity inside of a building that had no idea how to do it to Opportunity Appalachia. Um, and that's kind of where we started really making connections. So that's where WVU Brownfields entered and the downtown Appalachia redevelopment initiative, which I think ran before DARE. Yeah, so we had DARE. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, so through those partnerships, we entered DOG, Downtown Appalachia Working Group, where we met a whole bunch of other people around the table that were doing the exact same things that we were doing at some level around the state. So through all those partnerships came capacity building for us as Unleashed Tiger. We learned a lot and we really worked with people who brought us under their wing to not just come beside of us, but they brought expertise to the table, but then they also taught us how they do what they do. And that has turned into this really cool property pipeline. Mm -hmm. So again, we came into it with a building and really good ideas. Um, and then once we figured it out and we had a little bit of a playbook and a little bit of a, a blueprint of what we were doing, we realized, hey, we can apply this somewhere else. So uh, we have that theater built building in downtown Grafton, single screen theater that everybody wants to be a theater, mm -hmm. theater again, right? Yeah. Um, and this is the project, you know, every community has that one project. This is the project in Grafton that has been restarted and stopped and restarted and stopped. Money has been raised and then not spent. So we went to the city and we said, hey, let us try, let us try. Um, so we gave them a proposal that said, let us come in and do the environmental work. Let us come in and put together a feasibility study. So Downstream Strategies and Brownfields have worked with us side by side on this project. And we just finished a feasibility study with architectural preliminary drawings that we're gonna be able to take back to the city actually this fall. So um, we've got those two going, and then we have Hazel Atlas and the Box Factory. So these two properties are riverfront premier properties that have been of absolutely no use to our community ever. Is that a fair statement? <laughs> um, so we have been with Downstream Strategies. They really have a heart for Grafton and um, these particular properties as they were working with Brownfields when they got an assessment grant um, that had kind of a specific focus in Grafton. So um, they've been working with the properties, owners of these two properties. And um, one of them sadly passed away earlier this year. Um, this is the, ha the Hazel Atlas. And um, unbeknownst to us, when he passed away, he decided to gift us that property. So um, this just happened, what, within the last month, yeah. I would say? A strategic death. <laughs> <laughs> um, we love Moses very much and his family for, for seeing, for yeah. buying into the vision of what we were doing here. So um, we were able to work with Brownfields and enter another partner, which is the West Virginia Land Stewardship Corporation, who's come along beside of us to take this Hazel Atlas property and do the phase one on it so that we can qualify for all of the circle of protections and all of the things, and then apply for a Brownfields cleanup. And then right beside of that property is the Box Factory, who again, separate owner, nothing happening there. Um, and these projects, both properties are dirty and contaminated. We know that going into it. So 
we are currently working on acquiring the box factory so that we can really combine those properties and turn it into economic recreation for our community. And no, we aren't using money to commission assassin. We're trying to do it right with this guy. <laughs> No strategic deaths. Yeah, well, really good point, and I would, I'll explain it from my town, and it probably matches your town for the most part. Um, you know, there's lots of these kind of properties, maybe buildings, land, whatever may be key to the community that's owned by an absentee owner that just lets it sit or it deteriorates a problem. Uh, and maybe the municipality or the county or whatever doesn't do the right things to, to kind of put some pressure on them to make them do the right things for the property. All that happens. And then ultimately, that that owner typically makes a sale, whatever else is a problem. Uh, Maybe the city, the county gets it, they have to tear it down and it's it's worthless or it's not used. And so it's that cycle. We've seen that over and over again in our community. And at one point we just decided this is this is an area that we want to stop. We want to try to stop this, stop the cycle. And it's tough because in a community like that, where that's happened for generations, there is a lack of spirit around this. There's a lack of this. We don't. It's not, I don't think they would tell you this, but they don't, we don't deserve this. We don't, we don't deserve the good things that you see in other communities, the redevelopment that happens, well, it's here, it's rapid, or whatever your town is, right? And so we're not only fighting the properties and the property owners and the right plans and the money and all that, and the great partners that come to help, we're also fighting ourselves and our own nature to believe that we're worth it and believe that our community can, can, can see these things realized and see the great things that come from it. And so that's, that's a huge piece that we, you know, it's up against us. I mean, tracking all these partners, and it's been great to have all this help, but I'm, I'm going to be really straight with you for a minute. All this help is coming from outside our community. It's not coming from us, according to potential transport that moved out of the community. This is from good helping us. But for the most part, it's all from groups of people who have a heart for what we're doing and what we want to see in our community. And I can't wait for the tipping point to reach when we have what we call the Cone Building and Cornerstone Project. We're hoping that people can see they're going to complain like the Dickens about. Yeah, I'm glad you're getting all positive stuff. We can people walk by, but they're going to be, hey, why would you put that much money? This is not their money, but why would you put that much money? This is never going to happen. We're getting all that. But hopefully at some point, there's a tipping point where people in the community look around and go, this is cool. And maybe I can do something or we can do something. And you have less fits and starts, less failures, less just, just that downward spiral of death in this community. Absolutely. So that's a little bit of the, the flywheel concept that you see here. So this is, we talked about the scope with which we see the world. The flywheel is kind of the philosophy within which we work, that just one little movement on that very inside gear will cause those bigger gears to start moving. So it's that idea that we really can be a cornerstone, make small movements in our community for much larger outcomes and impact. Um, and just to build upon what Alex was saying, we have spent about $250,000-ish on the Cohen building to date. Not a single dollar of that has come from our local community. Um, so if you're, and we came into this with zero dollars. Again, big visions, big ideas. So there's technical support money out there to get started, which brings me to probably the most important piece of anything that we ever talk about inside this community which are the lessons that we've learned so far. And you guys can see them there. Just get started. Pull together a, a community team that is dedicated, that's willing to put in the hard work because five years later, you're still gonna probably be working on it, right? Um, someone has to go first. Somebody just has to take the first step. Um, communicate clearly with your partners that you bring to the table. And probably the most important lesson that I have learned through being kind of the project manager of this project has been the partners that I bring to the table. There's a lot of folks out there that see an opportunity to get involved in this world and make a pretty easy penny by closing deals and bringing little bits of value here and there. Choose your partners that buy into the overall vision of what you're trying to achieve inside of your community. Bring in their expertise and their vision. And that's when the magic happens at that table. Yeah, that, that whole idea of getting started. I don't know if they've ever ridden a pedal assist bike or anything like that, but it's a little like that where you've got to get the first effort. And then sometimes the additional effort will shock you. The other people will come in and help. Um, and get out of pretty quick. So sometimes you push the project, and the project pushes you. Um, but it's uh it's it's been a it's been a wild ride, and it's it's very encouraging to see folks like Brown Page and then so many others down to have stepped in, and you can tell they buy into the vision. The, 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 the belief, the myth, whatever you want to call it, that, that we still have a hard community, but we want to see it realized too. It's awesome to see people buy into that and be a part of it. That's, that's probably the biggest one.
Absolutely. That's our contact information. If we can ever be of service to any of you, we are always happy to talk, take questions, share our experiences along the way. Uh, thanks, you guys. There was a point in there where I wanted to say, preach it. <laughs> right? All right, let's see if I can find my spot, right? Is this, I got to go back this way, right? Yeah. It didn't get in the order, but that's just part of the tech deal we got going on today, right? So you've heard from uh, Maya about an organizational, the county bringing in them uh, as a provider uh, to to help several communities, but again, specifically that community. And again, these, these basic facade and other type of transformational activities that can get that ball rolling. You've heard the nuts and bolts behind a couple who has taken on a challenging redevelopment in the heart of a very small town, very remote, and they're successfully bringing that to fruition. And we're going to, I think, reinvest in this couple to be able to add the fun spaces in the courtyard area and that garage space in theirs. So I'm glad that that could be said. And then we get motivated by a group like Unleashed that just wants to change the, the look of their community. And that's the whole point of this session. And now I'm going to give you a little case study of uh, what downtown Appalachia uh, and, and EPA and just different uh, aspects brought a, a space to life in a, in a really cool way in Bluefield, West Virginia. Uh, the the uh, building, shoot, I can't think of the name of the building now. Anyway, this old building on Main Street. Um, had had a variety of uses. The last use was like a, uh, a hangout place where karaoke and a bar in, in the lower level. I don't even know what would go on in the upper levels, but it had been left vacant and that's basically the uh, first level space. Uh, Jim Spencer, the EDA director for the city of Bluefield said it smelled like a wet dog. And uh, I love to use that descriptor. The city had an EPA assessment grant, and so they assessed this property before they took ownership of it. And um, they did find contamination, uh, asbestos and lead paint, but not to a degree where they needed a cleanup grant. Um, but the assessment grant helped clarify things. And um, so Jim, who is a very, um, just a guy that will get things done, um, contacted me for the Downtown Appalachia Program, uh, the statewide uh, redevelopment initiative. And uh, we were able to give him an architectural analysis that showed that this building was still viable, that still could be used for uh, reuse. And the architect that we engaged uh, provided some, some redevelopment uh, analysis and assured that the, the uh, structural integrity was there and the life safety features and the uh, egress and things like that were all in compliance to be able to have this building be reused, not as a, a housing unit, but as a, a retail or some kind of commercial space. The EPA assessment grant clarified the environmental issues um, and uh, he got a local foundation to um, contribute so that they could address the environmental remediation and then downtown Appalachia, uh, it's just interesting the timing of things and all these projects have this, this Moses dying. So Moses, the guy who owned that Atlas Glass property in Grafton, his name was Moses and he passed away. We had met with Moses and it wasn't gonna be an easy transaction, but then uh, one thing led to another. And uh, so it wasn't a strategic death, but the, his, passing that on to his family led to that. Well, the timing here was that as we were analyzing the Hawley building, I remember the name, in Bluefield, the local hospital closed. And so people were gonna have to go to Princeton now to get their medical services, their, their early med. And Joe, you guys were the uh, assessors, yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm glad you're here. That, yeah, that project, um, it's hard to even imagine from beginning to end what, what that building looked like. And so the uh, Bluestone Health Clinic that was in Bluefield was looking to expand their services. And they were considering building a new site, building a, a greenfield outside of town. And Jim contacted them, had them take a look at the building. And they were like, yeah, thanks, but no thanks. This, is, this building was rough. 
they were a federally, federally qualified health clinic, and so they were going to have the funding, but they, they were definitely looking at how they wanted to invest it. So Jim came back to downtown Appalachia. We got the arch architect back to the building, and he specifically laid out um, how you could have a clinic, because this building is a weird angle. You can see right there. It's got weird lines. There's no square <laughs> point to this building, and uh, it was shown that you could have a really nice clinic on the first floor. You could have other spaces on the second and third floor for uh, like consultation, for group therapies, for food collection, for all kinds of community services, and they were sold. And so they took their federally qualified health clinic money, and that space we were looking at there on the left a minute ago is a little bit different angle, but that's that same space today. This is the street walk-in waiting space. You saw the way that the building looked from the front early on, and that's, they opened up the windows and everything looks great. As the architect was, again, doing his job at the building, he discovered there used to be a skylight on the building, which had been closed up, all the floors had been filled in, and there was no way. Well, they designed the ability to see from the space on your right there, that's the kind of internal lobby, a waiting room at the doctor's offices. And when you look up, there's natural light coming down through all three floors of the building through this skylight. I think that's an amazing outcome. And I got to go down there a year and a half after first visiting that dark, dank, and dismal building and um, just be able to observe the ribbon cutting on the Bluestone Health Clinic, a walk-in facility in downtown Bluefield. It's like the poster child for what downtown redevelopment should be. It's what the Cohen building is gonna be. If you've been to downtown Grafton, you know, hard pressed. Why is that B&O station sitting there? If you've, again, if you've not seen it, it's like the most amazing looking building. And somehow we hope we can make a difference in that building, but the Cohen building right down the street, it's right in the center. It's gonna be the thing that launches along with the Manos Theater, and then we're going to bring the riverfront alive with these uh, other two properties. You know, it's going to take, we got to do a cleanup, but it's going to be, uh, you know, all hands at deck. It's going to come to life. The uh, former theater site in Franklin is going to be a centerpiece right in downtown uh, where people are living in good spaces. You saw the transformation. I walked through with these guys. These apartments were rough. They've made them cool. And uh, so those spaces are nice and the, the retail spaces down below, the commercial spaces are great. And Maya described how you can just, you gotta bring that transformation to Main Street and um, the assistance is out there. And I know I'm preaching to the choir quite a bit here because this is folks who have been uh, involved in this or are trying to do it. But let's let's just not ever lose hope and, and know that uh, in every different way, we are bringing good things to the table that transform communities that from the industrial legacy that we got going on here in West Virginia and Pennsylvania uh, to um, vibrant spaces where people wanna live, work and play uh, maybe in the same space. Um, yeah, so that's what this session was about. What time did we leave here? What time is it? I don't know. Oh, wow. Did really good. Everybody got through their presentations really great. Uh, any questions or anything to add to the conversation that you guys have? Yes, sir. I, I, I have a couple of questions. All right. One, taking off my USDA hat for a minute, I have to say, uh, Mon Forest Town is like a good Frank. On that. Mighty uh, the second question is for the Unleashing Tiger group, and it is kind of two separate questions. One is how do you select the community capitals uh, that you select in your metrics? Because, you know, community development, we're used to the community capital floor and floor. So I'm curious that like, you're different, obviously, a little bit from that. And then I guess my second question is, you know, you mentioned about a single dollar local investment, uh, which looking, putting back on my day job hat and looking at those 30,000 foot 
uh, you, which I, and, and Ray probably knows, stand in between of much of my, much of my time. But how do you demonstrate local investment without that? You know, I, I realize, you know, obviously ground fields is good, a lot of the hubs, a lot, you know, a lot of the resources. But when you say they come outside of your community, and then when you go to apply for that federal funding, that state funding, you know, obviously most of the agencies want to see some demonstration of local investment, local uh, commitment to that. So, so that's my two questions. Yeah, I, I do have the second and first and gains are better than the previous person. Um, so I, I, when we say there's no low, so they're happy to write a letter or rewrite a letter they sign. Um, they're happy, they want to see good things, it's fine. Most of them don't typically believe the good things can happen, but they're they're happy to just stand by and let us do these things. So that's support, if you will, in our community right now. I don't mean to be broad. I'm not trying to be negative. It's just that's the reality of where we are right now. That said, there's a lot of community members who are really interested and are supportive. Um, and so when you talk about financial support, we've gotten we've got nods that when when you're ready, come get us kind of thing. But they're not they're only first money yet. And so for organizations like yourself, I just mentioned you have been down there for a while. I uh, wanted to run my past trying to find some money. Um, but but it really comes down to when when that time comes, we will. Now we, we did have a moment in the project where we did have to get in front of the county and ask for something, and they all turned white as ghosts, you know, to try mm -hmm. to sort that out. Because they don't think they see a building like this and say, well, hundred thousand dollars ought to do everything we could do. That's <laughs> you know, so it's the scale is just not there's just so many things we're trying to push through. So yes, they're supportive and they're good people and, and they're kind and they want to do good things, but they, they're so not into like driving vision or pushing forward. And so the support's there, I guess, as a when we're ready to fill the gap we've created that they can easily slide into the operation. So when it comes time, we are going to be from back Tuesday, we're going to be from the county about about this type of property. We say, okay, guys, we've got everything ready. Now what we need is some. The other piece that goes along with that is in the Cohen building specifically, which is where the 250000 has been spent on technical assistance, there is no federal or state funding on that project. So we worked with CDFIs, CDEs, through market and historic tax credit programs to bring together investors outside of the federal or state funds. So that may eventually come into the stack, but the way that the capital is actually built, there's no requirement. Secondly, but just to get on what Alex said, there's a there's a strategic place for local community dollars to play. And there has to be almost in most of these small communities a proof of concept before anybody will ever say it's been my tax dollars there, right? So there's a little bit of that that we wanted to bring to the local leadership a completely done project to say we want to do this. This can be done in this community. We've already done it and you'll invest in yourself. Right, we have a proven playbook. So there's there's strategy behind that too. We could have gone and asked for thirty thousand dollars early on with technical assistance. And probably we probably would have not, but it wasn't the most strategic use of the available funds. That's right. And I, I'll give you an example. And this is more cathartic maybe for me for all of you. We're, we go when we finally do go to the county and we have an ask um, of a project. We're creating fifty five jobs, sixty five jobs mm -hmm. in, in this project in a small town like ours. So that's game watchers. Um, and the economic development directors in there, as well as one of the commissions, and I'm asked two questions of them. One is, well, if you bring all these all these jobs in, where are they going to park? What are you doing? The next question was from a county commission. Well, we bring all these six jobs. Where are they going to live? You know, I mean, I don't create them. I mean, I'm creating psychological problems. How do we solve those? I can't solve them now. So it's it's just you know, but you leave it out there and you hope maybe maybe they're going to be that way. So next time. You know, so next on Tuesday when we go in and we say well, maybe maybe there's different thought process. So a lot of education between mm -hmm. short results and long-term community impact, right? And so there's a lot of education that has to come in into a local community that's never seen anything like that happen. And and I don't want that one either, to be honest with you. It's not like I I mean I just want things to work. And so we've got experts that popped around. So it's not like I have the right path. So I don't want to sound like you know I'm, I'm some we we don't we don't we've learned along the way. It's just the energy and the force, you know. That's not what you've been doing. Uh, um, so, I don't know, well, since 17, I started poking around, I've been her in 19, and we've been on the track since then. Learned a lot of attacking. Sadly, they say you're the most company. <laughs> and you said the lack of spirit, the lack of hope, the lack of vision, and, and you have to find somebody rich outside the community, you know, with the project. And I, I'm I'm a guest, but I could just, so it was good to hear you say that. I mean, you're still hanging in there, 
because I mean, I feel sorry for the people. I guess they stay in one location for so long, you don't see how things can be. And they've just given up hope. They've seen these horrible buildings for the last 20, 30 years. I just believe yep. So uh, I'm, I'm sorry to walk through that, but I, I do hope to see the for you. Can I add something, Ray? Yeah. Um, so I'm Amanda with Friends of the Chief. Our office supporters, the, our Crescent County is, is um, next to Taylor, and we've been working on, I mean, essentially, we first we had to clean up the river, and we, and we did that. Um, it took a, a while, it took almost um, 20 years, but then we had then we had the opportunity to have an offense. Oh my God, what are we, we going to do? We have an opportunity to bring people back to the river. Um, and it still took um, us just doing the damn work before we are hanging with our regular friends. Huh? So I've been a friend of the chief 13 years. The organization is celebrating its 30th year. And in 2020, 2021, we received our first $12,000 from the Preston County Commission mm -hmm. to, for match for one of our buildings at our trailhead. Mm -hmm. That project started in 2009 with a $5,000 focus grant from the Brownfields Assistance Center, and we cut the ribbon on our million dollar tailhead in April. We hey. built a parking lot, and Ooh. people are freaking out. And it's not exactly like we don't deserve nice things. And I'm not, I wasn't going to build a, you know, something that you're going to see at the local park. I mean, we have a beautiful structure, beautiful, but obviously the river is a highlight, and we haven't even cut the ribbon on the trail yet. <laughs> and the Preston County Commission gave us a hundred, um, I don't even know, 14,000 of their ARPA money after that. So, All like, right. it's going to come. Yep. You just, you know, it's Keep just, pushing it's that rock up uphill. It's like, you know, here and then, you, you know, we don't, we never have local money. We never have local cash match. Um, but it'll come. Um, did, did we get everything answered that you asked, buddy? The oh, the pillars, yeah. What's that? The pillars, how you build the pillars. How we built the pillars of the almost heaven index? Yeah, hey, basically how you select those. And maybe I can add on to that, that's how we do, how do you pick things that are going to end up being like tangible and measurable, you know, or quantifiable, if you will? Because most of those seem to be qualified, you know, quality rather than quantifiable. Yeah, they are. There's a huge part of that that is quality. You know, you, there are things you can measure for it, and you kind of plug those in, but it, it comes down to be this, it's 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 not arbitrary, but it is a little bit of, okay, do you think that helps sustain those? Is this going to impact, is there a culture and heritage piece to this, or is it purely just economic vitality? And it is a little bit of uh, qualitative. Um, or mostly qualitative, but those those came. I don't know if you're familiar with the, the First National Happiness Index, and that's a uh, Bhutan, right? This company or a country that said, so "Hey, we're not going to measure by gross domestic product. We're going to measure by this. How happy are our people?" And it just struck it just struck me. That's been I don't know 20 years ago when I first read about that, and it, it, it struck me. So it's kind of stuck with me. And when I began thinking, okay. You know, I'm living in this community. I've mean, grown a company. I'm a, I'm a father and a husband. But what am I doing for my community? Let me try something. But I had to have some. I had to have something I get my hand around. Or my head around. It's going to make a difference. It's going to make outcomes. It's supposed to just. I mean, I, well, it's not like so negative. I don't mean to be negative and positive. But so many organizations make scrap little money around. Oh, it's good. It's little education projects. That's all good. But it doesn't make a difference in the community ultimately. And so I had. To, I didn't want to just do that. And I was given um, advice by several people, the veterans in the industry, they kind of said as much. So that's just what really, really kind of put that together. Well, we could take that, overlay that around what's important to us as a community, and then use that as a scorekeeping mechanism and a, a project you can think about that. So the pillars themselves aren't built to be quantifiable, but the programs that happen that we score under them are, right? So like with the Cohen project, we look to see how many of the pillars does this touch and what are the direct outcomes? Economic vitality, 65 jobs. Check right <laughs> culture and education. We've got the YMCA coming into the building. What are the programs that bring them in? So it's a framework with, 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 and the way that we really look at the projects and programs and say, Yes, this is needed. Maybe this isn't. And then the talk about some other. Yeah, it's a great point because it's the project itself. And even like, what are the tenants? You think about this tenants. I don't want anybody going in there. So, what. Well, we could, but, you know, the rest, but, but it's like, wait a minute, does this, does this score? And it scores, but wow, okay, this is very nice to see that.
the company was 75% pre lease within the first year of conceptual planning because we married the lease and community with the space in the plan through the, the pillars. No, I think that's very smart. I mean, the reason I asked my question is, you know, that way is. I think it's a smart way, first way to measure. I think it's a very creative way to measure. It's not a West Virginia way. You should probably have <laughs> to measure it. And, and I'd like to be able to translate that from all data to quantum data. Um, and I'm just thinking, too, you know, like you're saying, the federal manager and that's required at this point. And that's great for you to translate it for the better than I'm saying, you know, for the hubs of the other organizations to do that funding. But I don't even match. As we all know, the government is, especially the government, is very good. <laughs> To transition. So uh, I'm just thinking about how you down the road, you know, go find, and think about the community we work in and how they can make the same translation uh, for their community, their downtowns. I, I think it's like Amanda said, what that last slide was that ever had, I heard supply with it. We just get a little bit of movement, a little bit of belief, and, you know, the leaders, and, and maybe the same leaders, or well, maybe new leaders step up because they see the momentum. I mean, it's all kind of mixed. And we're seeing, I mean, at least in some of my opinion, I'm saying. There have been leaders who came to my very basis. A lot of grassroots, if you catch the common theme in, in Amanda's and the years and, and what uh, the Connors have taken on, and uh, even the work in Bluefield. So it's pretty neat that uh, there's multiple ways to get that flywheel turning. And, and it helps that kind of view, it helps because you have lots of people come in who have their ideas about their feet. Things, you know, you're in a small town, you're going to step on their feet, you know, people, and that's a problem. But if you're, and you can get pulled this direction, this direction. So if then you're not doing anything, at least you have a focus. But come in and say, well, maybe you better do your thing. Oh, yeah. And any other questions? I know anybody would be happy to follow up if you get back. Oh, yeah, Ken. I don't want to dominate this this time, like Alex, but, but I do have a question for Allegheny as well. I, mean, I have a question for all of you, honestly. But the one that stands out, you seem to have great community engagement and an active entrepreneur base, and that's something uh, I, a lot of places must be a struggle with. It's starting to be overcome. I work in the Southern Coal Fields. Uh, so, do you think the MTAP, like the program talking about the facade the, and the rental assistance, does that seem to help engage entrepreneurs and kind of push people over that um, from the entrepreneur to the entrepreneur? Yeah, I think, um, you know, yeah, certainly having access to those coupled with a lot of the educational opportunities that are available to businesses, I mean, that's the piece of the access to resources is often missing. So there's a lot of, you know, small business support for education, but not necessarily access to resources. So they're sort of filling that gap within in such a small geography that, um, you know, can be really effective in that way. So I think that that is the, the second part of the question. Um, and yeah, the piece about community engagement and and kind of you know how does how does that move it forward? I think it gets back to some of the con the conversation we've had just about people start to see things changing, um, particularly because they you know given input and might have said, well, we want a deli, and then suddenly there there is a deli, like, um, and that would be a really small project, but um, it it can just go so far to showing that that's you know that's what that's what can happen. Um, it definitely takes time now. That's not a question. When those these grants come through and the new page and other the solid work, are you looking at these later? I mean, are they is, is further investment following that you know, from those entrepreneurs or the store shore owners or other places? Is other investment you guys aren't part of coming in as second money and things in the future years later? Yeah, that's happening in, in, in definitely in some of the areas. Um we have a, a really interesting uh uh Financing organization, I think, like what's it called, the Bridgeway Capital, um, which does some investment in um, Eastern Ohio, Western Pennsylvania, uh, but particularly in Allegheny County, um, has has made a lot of investment because they they don't want to go into communities that is not that organizational capacity, and that the these aren't already kind of growing, and so they're coming through and saying, okay, that those those pieces are there, and now we can make the investment. I think. The county is also very deliberate um, in terms of leveraging this program to be able to say, um, you know, now we know where to make investment because when we go through, we talk about, you know, where are those near-term commercial opportunities? Um, if people are put, you know, able to put together financing easier. The county will, you know, invest, make investments easier, and um, 
there's a, another interesting project which I'm hoping and maybe we'll maybe we'll do a case study next year, but it's not through Allegheny together and we haven't been involved in, but um, Allegheny County acquired properties in Braddock, uh, PA, uh, which is within, you know, within Allegheny County, a large commercial center, um, and famous for a lot of different reasons <laughs> in Pennsylvania, but, um, seven, acquired seven commercial properties and then actually, um, had individuals, uh, go through the developer training program and then apply to be the developer of those properties and have commercial tenants that were getting, you know, Small independent bookstore and a small coffee shop, and you know it, it's just a very interesting. And and that's what the, you know the county is sort of looking at that, and I think you know if Allegheny together, Braddock did a comprehensive plan along with some, of, uh, some adjacent communities, but the Allegheny together program kind of took that and like focused it in a commercial district and looked at what are the those properties that could be utilized in a program like that. So those those investments have been made, and, and that's always exciting to see, right? Um, Something that our firm just really worked hard to do is, is to create plans and work when we work with our clients to make sure that the, the implementation is just as strong as the planning itself. Because, and I, I come from 20 years of working in community development, and so I've seen a lot of plans sitting on a shelf. So um, for me, I was, you know, the transition to this, this side of things, it, it could really only be in this, this firm where we're looking uh, at, at how we can link things really move forward. Well, I appreciate you guys making this your last stop before lunch and our closing plenary. Um, if you do have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out my direction. I can put you in touch with the folks or directly to them. Uh, but also thanks for everything that you guys do in your communities or in support of communities through the various organizations that you're a part of. Thanks again for our speakers.